Tanzini to Temtek Minani Wago Maganak, Chelsea Valnit Siga Sonny Wamantusak Aignik Mutoksin, Magani Wigan Utan Montreal Canutes. My name is Chelsea Vowell. I'm from Lac Saint Anne, Alberta, Treaty Six Territory. I'm reading this from Montreal. Nui I Mitsuke Stomawal. So I'm going to read to you uh, from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission Summary Report, pages 321 to 325. The section is Life Stories, Testimonies, and Witnessing as Teachings. And I'm going to need to drink water as I go, so forgive me. Reconciliation is not possible without knowing the truth. In order to determine the truth and be able to tell the full and complete story of residential schools in this country, it was fundamentally important to the Commission's work to be able to hear the stories of survivors and their families. It was also important to hear the stories of those who worked in the schools, the teachers, the administrators, the cooks, the janitors, as well as their family members. Canada's national history must reflect this complex truth so that 50 or 100 years from now, our children's children and their children will know what happened. They will inherit the responsibility of ensuring that it never happens again. Regardless of the different individual experiences that children had as students in the schools, they shared the common experience of being exploited. They were victims of a system intent on destroying intergenerational links of memory to their families, communities, and nations. The process of assimilation also profoundly disrespected parents, grandparents, and elders in their rightful roles as the carriers of memory, through which culture, language, and identity are transmitted from one generation to the next. In providing their testimonies to the TRC, survivors reclaim their rightful place as members of intergenerational communities of memory. They remembered so that their families could understand what happened. They remembered so that their cultures, histories, laws, and nations could once again thrive for the benefit of future generations. They remembered so that Canada will know the truth and never forget. The residential school story is complicated. Stories of abuse stand in sharp contradiction to the happier memories of some survivors. The statements of former residential school staff also varied. Some were remorseful, while others were defensive. Some were proud of their students and their own efforts to support them, while others were critical of their own school and government authorities for their lack of attention, care, and resources. The stories of government and church officials involved acknowledgement, apology, and promises not to repeat history. Some non-Aboriginal Canadians expressed outrage at what had happened in the schools and shared their feelings of guilt and shame that they'd not known this. Others denied or minimized the destructive impacts of residential schools. These conflicting stories, based on different experiences, locations, time periods, and perspectives, all feed into a national historical narrative. Developing this narrative through public dialogue can strengthen civic capacity for accountability and so do justice to victims, not just in the legal sense, but also in terms of restoring human dignity nurturing mutual respect, and supporting healing. As citizens use ceremony and testimony to remember, witness, and commemorate, they learn how to put the principles of accountability, justice, and reconciliation into everyday practice. They become active agents in the truth and reconciliation process. Participants at commission events learn from the survivors themselves by interacting directly with them. Survivors, whose memories are still alive, demonstrated in the most powerful and compelling terms that by sitting together in sharing circles, people gain a much deeper knowledge and understanding of what happened in the residential schools than can ever be acquired at a distance by studying books, reading newspapers, or watching television reports. For Indigenous peoples, stories and teachings are rooted in relationships. Through stories, knowledge and understanding about what happened and why are acquired, validated, and shared with others. Writing about her work with survivors from her own community Social work scholar Quilcia Matt, Robina Ann Thomas, apologies for the not good uh, pronunciation there, said, I never dreamed of learning to listen in such a powerful way. Storytelling, despite all the struggles, enabled me to respect and honour the ancestors and the storytellers while at the same time sharing tragic, traumatic, inhumanly believable truths that our people had lived. It was this level of integrity that was essential to storytelling. When we make personal what we teach, we touch people in different and more prof in a more profound way. At a community hearing in St. Paul, Alberta in January 2011, Charles Cardinal explained that although he did not want to remember his residential school experiences, he came forward because we've got to let other people hear our voices. When he was asked how, given the history of the residential schools, Canada could be a better place, 
he replied that we must listen to the people. When asked the same question in Beausejour, Manitoba, Laurie MacDonald said that Canada must begin by doing exactly what is happening now. Governments have got to know that they can never, ever, ever do this again. In Ottawa, survivor Victoria Grant Boucher said, I'm telling my story for the education of the Canadian general public so that they can understand what stolen identity is, you know, how it affects people, how it affects an individual, how it affects family, how it affects community. I think the non-Aboriginal person, Canadian, has to understand that a First Nations person has a culture. And I think that we as Aboriginal people have so much to share if you just let us regain that knowledge. And I also take to heart what elders talk about. We have to heal ourselves. We have to heal each other. And for Canada to heal, they have to allow us to heal before we can contribute. That's what reconciliation means to me. Survivors told the Commission that an important reason for breaking their silence was to educate their own children and grandchildren by publicly sharing their life stories with them. The effect of this on intergenerational survivors was significant. At the Manitoba National event, Desiree Shabi said, I have sat through this week having the honour of listening to the stories from survivors, and I just feel, I just really want to acknowledge everybody in this room, you know, all of our elders, all of our survivors, all of our intergenerational survivors. We're all sitting here in solidarity right now, and we're all on our own journey, and yet we are sitting here together with so much strength in this room. It really is phenomenal. And I just want to acknowledge that and thank everybody here. And to be given this experience, this opportunity, you know, to sit here and to listen to other people and listen to their stories and their experiences, you know, it's really humbled me as a person in such a way that is indescribable. And I can take this home with me now and I can take it to my own house because my dad is a residential school survivor. I've lived the traumas, but I've lived the history without the context. Survivors' life stories are teachings rooted in personal experience. The human relationships of their childhoods were scarred by those who harmed them in the schools. Their stories teach us about what it means to lose family, culture, community, self-esteem, and human dignity. They also teach us about courage, resilience, and resistance to violence and oppression. An ethical response to survivors' life stories requires the listener to respond in ways that recognize the teller's dignity and affirm that injustice were, injustices were committed Non-Indigenous indigenous witnesses must be willing to risk interacting differently with Indigenous people, with vulnerability, humility, and a willingness to stay in the decolonizing struggle of our own discomfort, and to embrace residential school stories as powerful teachings, disquieting moments that can change our beliefs, attitudes, and actions. A number of former residential school staff came to the Commission to speak not only about their perspective on the time they spent in the schools, but also about their struggles to come to terms with their own past. Florence Kafer, a former teacher, spoke at the Manitoba National Event. And from my English ancestors, I apologize today for what my people did to you. I taught in two residential schools. In 1954, I taught in Norway House United Church Residential School for three or four years, and then I taught in the Alberni United Church Indian Residential School in BC. I worked very hard to be the best teacher I could be, and I did not know about the violence and cruelty going on in the dormitories and in the playrooms. But I found out through one of my former students, who was five years old when he came to Norway House. His name is Edward Gamblin. And Edward Gamblin and I have gone through a personal truth and reconciliation. In a media view afterward, Ms. Kafer said that she contacted Mr. Gamblin after hearing his song a few years ago, describing the cultural, physical, and sexual abuse he had suffered at Norway House School. She said, I just cried. I told my sister that I could never think of teaching in the residential school in the same way again. She called Gamblin after hearing the song. He told her he had to hide his abuse from the good teachers for fear he would lose them if they found out what was happening, and left. He invited Kefer to a healing circle in 2006, and they became close friends. Kafer said Gamblin taught her not to be embarrassed about her past, being part of a school where abuse took place. I was 19, and you don't question your church and your government when you're 19, but I certainly question my church and my government today. Gamblin said Kafer taught him how to forgive. There are good people, teachers, who don't deserve to be labeled, he said. Some family members of former staff also came forward. At the Manitoba National Event, Jack Lee told the Commission, my parents were staff members of the Indian Residential School in Norway House. 
I was born on a reserve in Ontario, and I moved with my family to Norway House when I was about one or two years old, and started school in the Indian residential school system, basically at, at the very start of a day student, as a white boy. My father agonized very much over his role, but I just want everyone to know that my father tried his best, as many other staff members tried their best, but they were working with so limited resources, and many of them felt very bad about their role in it, but they chose to stay in the system because it was still better than nothing. It was still better than abandoning the system and abandoning the students that were in it. At the Atlantic National event, Mark DeWolf spoke to us about his father, the Reverend James Edward DeWolf, who was the principal at two residential schools, St. Paul's in Alberta and Latouk in Quebec. He said, I'm quite hesitant to speak here this morning. I'm not here to defend my father so much as to speak part of the truth about the kind of person my father was. I think he was an exemplary principal of an Indian residential school. Part of the story will be about what I saw around me, what my parents tried to do, however effective that was, however well-intentioned that was, however beneficial or not beneficial it was. You will at least, when you leave here today, have a bit more of the story, and you may judge for yourselves. I hope you will judge with kindness, understanding, and generosity of spirit. My father did so many things, coached the teens, blew the whistle, or shot off the starting pistol at the sports days. Twelve o'clock at midnight on the coldest of winter days, he would be out on the rink that he had constructed behind the school, flooding it so the children could skate. He devoted his life to the service of his church, his God, and those that he thought had been marginalized, oppressed. It's a terrible shame that there were not more like him. When we leave today, though, let's remember that when you have a system like the residential school, there are the individuals within the system, some of whom are good, decent, loving, caring people, and some of whom are blind, intolerant, predatory. My father worked within the system trying to make it a better one. Thank you.